Simon Phipps joins me this week. We're going to talk about SALT, which is the remote execution engine that allows you to run the same command on multiple machines. Looks pretty interesting. You're going to want to see this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps, episode 191 for November 16th, 2011. Salt. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Ford, featuring Wi-Fi connectivity with available sync in my Ford Touch. Now your car can be a Wi-Fi hotspot. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, the projects you've never heard of, the projects you've heard lots about. I know we cover pretty much the entire base on this show, and so I'm very happy to be bringing you this kind of conversation each week. But of course, I'm always joined by a wonderful co-host. Again, you may his voice may be familiar from the last three weeks of having him as co-host. Welcome back, Simon Phipps. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I actually made the trek over here to the United States, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting in the glorious surroundings of uh, Leo's brick house. Mm -hmm. I've met all of the, the charming and beautiful staff um, and seen all of the expensive toys, so uh, I'm, it's great to be back again. You, you say charming and beautiful like you're either charming or beautiful. Is that true? Uh, well, it is binary, yes. <laughs> Great, great, great. Yes, uh, I, you, now you're in the spot that I still haven't been in. I haven't been to the new brick house. I was at the old uh, cottage many years ago, but uh, haven't been in the brick house sometime when I get to the Bay Area, I'm going to have to come up and visit there. So thank you for uh, making the trek up to there. We uh, really appreciate you uh, coming in for the show. And uh, if, you're, if you're not watching the video, you should really check out the video every once in a while on this show to kind of see what the brick house looks like because it's really nice when we have a co-host that speaks from there. Um, so uh, you're not uh, – I happen to be drinking some of that wonderful tea that I mentioned before, the PG Chips tea. Uh, are you uh, drinking that today or? Did you well, get a chance to drink that? Now that I'm here over in the uh, over in the colonies, uh, <laughs> the, all of that good British tea doesn't make it over here very easily. And so uh -huh. uh, I did check the uh, well-stocked kitchen and bar that they have here in the brick house <laughs> and discover they didn't seem to have any PG tips. Oh, so, oh it's, it's uh, delicious. Yeah. I'm, I'm addicted to it now, so I'm very, very happy to, that, uh, that sitting here at, at the client's location, they do, in fact, provide that for free for me. Uh, so the show is not about you and me. The show is about our guest. We have a really wonderful guest on today. It's uh, Thomas Hatch. He's going to talk to us about his fledgling project, SALT. And from what I can understand, looking at the documentation, SALT is a remote execution engine uh, so that it uh, basically you type one command in one place and it goes off to many, many machines and runs the same command in all sorts of places. And there are all sorts of plugins to do things like, uh, you know, see what the uptime is and, and manage what packages are installed and so on. And I understand he's also sort of addressing the the Puppet Chef uh, CF Engine market, trying to get to where this thing can also do configuration management. So I think it's going to be really cool to talk to him about that, especially since there's a lot of that going on right where I'm thinking and working today. Um, also, it's based on 0MQ, which uh, I'm also very fascinated by since I'm looking at it for some of my projects. You know, we're going to have the, uh, the the guy who invented 0MQ on coming up in a few weeks. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that probably, about how it relates to 0MQ and how it uses it. But uh, 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 any thoughts on that, Simon, before we move on? Well, I, I'm very interested by how young this project is. You know, it seems to have huge capabilities despite being, uh, it looks like it's um, uh, a, less than a year old. And uh, it certainly seems to be standing on the shoulders of giants here. So I'm going to be very interested to find out how it's working, uh, how easy it is to get installed, and, mm -hmm. um, and find out how he's been able to get so much done in so little time. Very good. Well, it uh, sounds like uh, we've got a great show ahead of us. So, But before we bring them on, we have to say that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Ford. One of the latest technologies from Ford Sync with My Ford Touch is Wi-Fi connectivity. This feature can turn your car into a Wi-Fi hotspot, giving you and your passengers Internet access for up to five devices at once. So here's how it works. You establish an Internet connection to the Wi-Fi hotspot by plugging in a portable wireless access card from one of the wireless carriers into a USB port located in the center armrest console or the glove compartment or under the radio, depending depending on the model. Or if you have a BlackBerry, you can connect to the hotspot wirelessly via Bluetooth. And next, you connect up to five Wi-Fi devices to the hotspot using a secure password, and you're in. 
Now, you or your passengers can access music, browse the Internet, download apps, or play games via Wi-Fi. Please don't do that while you're driving. That's very dangerous. Okay. They can connect their laptops, tablet, mobile phones, or other Internet devices to the hotspot, up to five devices at once, all without additional subscription or expense. Ford Sync with My Ford Touch features Wi-Fi connectivity. It's available in the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. That's, uh, that's really great that Ford is sponsoring the show. We really appreciate that when they do that. And thank you, Ford, for sponsoring Foss Weekly. Now let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Thomas, welcome to the show. Hey, glad I can be here. Very good, very good. And where are, we, where, no, no, where are you speaking to us from? Um, I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake City, Utah, somewhere in the center time zone. No, that's, uh, that's mountain time zone, isn't it? Yep, yep, that's mountain time. Very good. And I've actually, I've been in Salt Lake, I think, probably 70 times in the last 10 years, uh, but only out of the airport just long enough to go to the hotel they put me in overnight uh, because they missed my connection there. So I have no idea what the rest of the city looks like. Well, you should go skiing sometime. <laughs> I should. I should. I, I used to ski all the time, but apparently I'm not doing that much anymore. Well, we didn't call you to uh, chat about uh, Salt Lake City. We called you to talk about uh, salt, which uh, surprisingly is the first word of Salt Lake City. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but uh, I gave a kind of a rough overview at the beginning of the show about what I think salt is. So uh, why don't you give us sort of the 30,000 foot view of uh, what is salt and what problem does it solve? Well, salt's a... I think a really exciting project because what, what we're doing is we've developed a system that allows you to seamlessly control large swaths of servers uh, in a very, very rapid manner. And not only, not only that, it allows us to do configuration management as well. So it's something that's akin to what Puppet and Chef can do, but it does it much more quickly and um, allows you to build systems which have very seamless communication across uh, a whole cloud or infrastructure of servers. Okay, so in my, in my reading about it, what I'm seeing is that it's um, mostly a, a remote execution engine, but you get to simply use things like um, a, a, a all servers with a star or a class of servers with a, some sort of identification, and then you say, do this on all the servers. Is that sort of the basis of it? Yeah. So it comes with a command line tool that allows you to say, okay, we're going to install, we're going to specify a target. And then that target can be just like a file system glob with their host names, or it can be a regular expression. Or you can even say, I want to target everybody who's got, uh, who's running Red Hat or who's running a Debian system or who has kernel version 2.6.37. And... Um, and then from there, you can execute a command. And you can execute a command on the servers that you're targeting. Um, either it's just a normal shell command, or you can go through and there's, I think there's 38 uh, modules that we have now that have preloaded commands uh, that, that will retrieve information for you automatically or do routine things like restart a daemon or... Um, install a package. Well, that sounds really interesting because uh, actually I remember back in my history, I used to do something very similar to that when I was working for this large company with a lowercase i at the beginning, whose name I will not mention. Uh, I was this admin for about uh, 30 machines that were sitting mostly on people's desks, but we had some Sun 3s, and that's going to date me there, Sun 386Is, Sun 4s, and a few servers that were sitting in the computer room. And I wrote this little Perl script about 100 lines long, inspired by something I saw actually on Usenet. I think it was 1991 or so. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was basically to run a command on every single machine. Now, but I didn't have the capability I think you just alluded to where it's not just running a command, but also running a module. Tell me, tell me more about what that is. So one of, the, one of the nice things about SALT is that um, it comes loaded with all of these predefined commands. And these predefined commands are pretty slick because what they allow you to do is just say, uh, send a command that says pkg.install and then the name of a package or service.restart, the name of a service, uh, or disk.usage, and, and it'll give you the disk usage. And one of the benefits of these commands is that instead of what a lot of system men have been doing for a long time, um, which is setting up, setting up these uh, SSH everywhere commands, is that 
Salt will automatically detect and map the right tools back to the correct uh, operating system. So the result is that we say pkg.install, say you're communicating with a Red Hat box over here and a Debian box over here um, and maybe a FreeBSD box over here, and it'll automatically route all of those, the, the Red Hat box over to Yum and the Debian box over to Apt and the uh, FreeBSD box over to package ad or package info uh, so, that it, so that it does a lot of that middle work for you. Um, and then same thing with other modules. So it's a really easy to just say, well, hmm, what's this complex command I need to run to get the disk usage well or, or anything? And chances are there's already a module that does that for you, which will make your life a lot easier. Okay, so how does how does this actually work? I, you know, again, dating myself in 1991, I was using RSH to like remotely log into each of the 30 boxes or whatever the particular identifier happened to be. Um, are you using SSH to do this? Are you are you logging into each box or, or how does this work? So when I when I ran through this the first time, I, I mean, this is like my fourth iteration of trying to make something like this that's that's more powerful than your classic SSH situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I realized that the, the best thing to do would be to use a system called Zero MQ. And so the downshot with using SSH is that it's a lot slower. Whereas I've been able to use Salt to communicate with thousands of servers and get information from all of them uh, back, back to my main uh, hub in less than half of a second. Mm. And um, the, the real trick there is the fact that, that it has a ZeroMQ backend. So ZeroMQ is this really fancy networking um, library that is developed by the guys who did AMQ. And so very fast, uses, uses this new messaging thing. And so we can publish a command out to everybody. And, um, and they all get it at the same time, and they can all send their turn back at the same time. And since we set up this persistent connection with ZeroMQ, then the result is that it's just incredibly fast. The, the big goal here was that, was that I could build applications on top of SALT that allow it or allow those applications to uh, operate off of live state data. So we say, I need to know something about my running systems. I'm not going to rely on some cached um, database that's querying them passively. I'm going to go out and get it. And I'm going to be able to get that information fast enough that it can function inside of inside of a running application. Okay, so in other words, uh, my my program had to know, um, you know, that the, the the machines that were Sun 386s were named, you know, X and Y, and the machines that were named Sun machines were Sun 4s were named this and so on. So what I could say, global shell, all the Sun 4s, the, the the information was all locally in my application. Are you saying that Salt can go out and say? What are you running? What are, what type are you? And then ask only those um, machines to do particular operations. Exactly. Um, the other nice thing is that the the setup they automatically just tie back in, and so you you start up a salt minion on one of the client ends, and um, they just hook into the master. The master knows where they are, and they can ask these questions, and we can and it can do these commands very much in line, so we can say. Uh, yeah, like like we were saying before, that if you've got these specific properties, then execute this specific command. Right. Now, this this all sounds absolutely fascinating software, um, and it sounds like there's a lot of thought gone into it, and there's a lot of software there. Where did it all come from? You just said that it's taken you four iterations. Where has all this code come from? Well, I, I started up just writing everything in, in my spare time back in February, and had the the foundation of it working. Um, by April. It's all just been me writing code between 10 and 1 at night. <laughs> um, previously to this, I had a couple of jobs I've had um, because, I mean, I've, I've worked as a system administrator. I've worked as a, uh, as a cloud engineer and these sorts of things. And this keeps coming up that, well, we need to just run these commands everywhere. Everybody's got their own special sauce, you know, and it's usually like a script that's using SSH. But I kept running into the fact that I wanted to be able to control virtual machines at these different companies. Um, and I wanted to use an RPC system to, to facilitate that. And so I, I, I used Funk. I wrote a system for one company that um, 
that does something similar. I mean, none of the code from from my previous iterations are installed, uh, mostly because I wrote them and I was just horribly dissatisfied with them over and over again, and continually thinking, how can I make this so that it can operate as fast as I need it to, and be able to um, have the dynamics that it needs to have, so that it can be pluggable, so it can have an API front end that works, so it can have an intuitive shell connection, and so that it can extend to do things like configuration management and really give us this seamless overview. And so a lot of a lot of the learning happened in, with previous employment and at previous jobs, and then I just figured one night that I was sick of trying to rewrite it all the time, and and then I just try and get it right. And I think I've got it right this time. <laughs> so uh, is there, are there people in the community who are helping you develop the code, develop uh, support for various platforms, or is it all your own work? Uh, the community end has been really exciting. Um, like I said, Salt's only been live really since about April. And um, the community has grown at, at I think, a pretty uh, steady pace. We've got... I think that we have 18 contributors at this point. We've got five or six guys who are really regular. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, Seth House, has written a, a huge framework for the documentation. Um, a number of individuals have been uh, very kind enough to come in and clean up some of my code so that it's a little cleaner. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, as well as add features. One of the really nice things about Salt and the community is that is built in such a way that these modules that we've been talking about with execution, as well as a number of different connected layers, are really easy to write. And so I've, I've received a ton of contributions with different modules, um, which, makes it, uh, which makes it a really good platform for people to contribute to, because it's very easy for them to come and say, I don't understand the code base. I don't need to understand the code base. But I, I see how these modules work. They're really simplistic. I can just chuck one in there and see if it fills a need and and we take it and put it in put it into the uh overall right. module pile so to speak so uh that contribution that's happening there what open source license are you using uh we're going with apache 2. right and you're leaving all the ownership of all the contributions in the hands of the uh, original contributors or are you uh, are you aggregating it all somewhere uh, the the copyrights are still in the hands of the contributors. Very cool. So if you yeah, if a, if a module comes in, it's your module. Right, right. So uh, going forward, um, you know, this sounds very vibrant, uh, very energetic community with a lot of contributors there. Um, are, are you expecting to remain organic, or do you think that you're going to need to have a more formal organization sometime soon? Um, we're still uh, well. I'm still really debating on the best way to go forward with that. I mean, there's there's thoughts of uh, just keeping it more as an organization. We just moved the code, for instance, from my GitHub account over to the Salt Stack organization. Uh, but still debating if this is something that uh, we want to look at starting a company or if it's something that would be better to just try and continue to build this uh, community conglomerate. So it's, there's, there's a lot of it's really up in the air at this point. So, and talking talking about that, um, do you have a business model in mind that you you think that you'll use there? You know, a consulting business model, or uh, do you think that it's going to remain many different contributors who are funded independently? Um, as far as as far as a business model goes, it would probably uh, rotate around more of a consulting situation. It would be along the lines of saying, "Hey, do you want to?" If somebody wants to implement Salt at, at, uh, for their cloud or for their infrastructure, um, because Salt can also enter into those realms where, where things like Puppet and Chef are, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. So I'm thinking that uh, we'd be able to send some consultants in, maybe rewrite uh, systems that are already written in Puppet or Chef or help somebody uh, implement a new system uh, based entirely on Salt and get that going and, and these sorts of things. We also have... Um, people in the community and myself who've worked on many, many clouds in the past, and so we're kind of we're kind of hoping that we'd be able to bring that expertise um, into companies to allow them to build uh, to build purpose-built clouds. Um, and the other thing that we're thinking that'll help us there from a 
from more of a cons this consulting perspective would be a, because SALT is configured really to scale from being able to handle, say, five servers to being able to handle 20,000, you know, plus plus servers distributed across multiple data centers. Well, it's interesting that you're looking at the uh, Puppet Chef configuration tool model. I, I you know, I, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about that normally Puppet is basically set up to phone home every 15 or 30 minutes or whatever to uh, uh, time its, uh, you know, checking in to say, hey, is there anything that I need to change in my configuration here? So with Salt, it looks like since you have continuous communication with the clients, um, you uh, you could basically make configuration changes like instantly and have them be propagated instantly. Is that that sounds like a real great advantage? Is that something that you're seeing as well? Yeah, it's been it's been really exciting because um, at at the companies that I've helped set up Salt so far, um, they've really enjoyed it. We've done a couple of puppet migrations, um, and normally we can re rewrite everything in Salt very quickly. It's because very sim the uh, the the code base is very very simplistic. But uh, but yeah, we we can say okay, we've got some new salt code. We know who it's going to apply to. We can go out to the the clients or the minions and say, hey, what are all of the modules that you care about? The minion comes back and we say, okay, have any of those modules that, that guy cares about changed? Yes, tell him to rerun. Which means that we don't have to have this clock going to rerun. We can be very reactive. And it's very easy to say, okay, we've got new code. We just push it to everybody. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that sounds a lot sharper than Puppet. Uh, uh, you know, where I'm at right now, there, there's all sorts of Puppet being used. Um, now, part of this is because of 0MQ, right? You mentioned that earlier in the show. And I've been doing some research on 0MQ because I'm actually looking at it for a project I'm doing here. Uh, can you tell us more about what that is and how it lets you scale to thousands of hosts? One of the things that's really nice about 0MQ is that it's incredibly lightweight. And so, and so what happens is that the, we've, we've been able to take a salt master and it can handle tens of thousands of concurrent 0MQ connections because of, because of the queuing methodology and because the connections are lightweight and, and they have very small messages that have been optimized for those. And so, I mean, that's one of the biggest things that allows us to scale. Uh, is yeah is, is zero MQ's ability to do this, and so um, yeah one of the big benefits that zero MQ affords us is of, yeah of course is scalability, but another nice thing is that um, the library gives us a ton of flexibility. So I've got I've got a chart in one of my one of my presentations that talks about the topology that we use for salt because we have. Uh, we have what's called a 0MQ pub-sub relationship. So mm -hmm. all the minions just attach to the 0MQ publisher. And then that publisher is able to send that information out in parallel to everybody for the commands. And then there's another interface called a, a request-reply interface that 0MQ, use, that 0MQ has that we use to send the information back from the minion over onto the master. And um, that's also where we've got a file server interface that allows the minion to download the information it needs to for configuration management or, or salt states, as we call them. Um, and then we've discovered that the internal processes are even faster with 0MQ. So instead of using the Python um, multiprocessing library for interprocess communication, we're using uh, 0MQ for interprocess communication on the master to manage, uh, to manage our workers and um, and to manage our standalone publisher interface and things like this, uh, because we've seen that it's again substantially faster than even just using the built-in stuff that uh, that comes with Python. Okay, so I just, and that was actually going to be my next question: is what is this all written in? And you just mentioned Python. Uh, why Python? Um, <laughs> why you know, I have a dog in this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The. Um, I've, I've been a fan of Python. It really has been the language that I've used the most of over the years. And um, uh, it, it really seemed like the right fit for, for what we were doing. Uh, we've also got uh, uh, the ability to, to implement Cython code. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things is that I, I don't want Salt to come out and people say, well, it's a Python project. We're, 
say, a Ruby shop, we don't want to use it. And so one of the things that we're working on is the ability to build modules in different languages. Um, and we're planning on being able to connect those with uh, using, using ZeroMQ processes so that we'd be able to say, okay, we've got all these modules. Right now they're all built in Python or, or a few of them are built in, in Cython so that you know, they compile down to C. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but in the future, we hope to be able to build modules in Ruby, Lua, Perl, or whatever. And same with being able to represent the, the state data that, that the configuration management's written in. Because right now it's written in, um, it's just a data structure, so it can be written in anything. So right now we support YAML, and JSON, and pure Python. But we anticipate to be able to support things like Ruby in the future, um, or, or other languages. So that it makes it a really good fit, regardless of what type of uh, shop you're working in. So in other words, and actually you can ask about that then, so is the protocol over the wire simple enough that if I have a ZeroMQ uh, client in Perl, like which I do, uh, that I could uh, have it sitting being one of these minions out there and get the information in, in a way that's actually useful? Uh, the only caveat to that right now is that my original imp implementation of the line protocol, it is very simple. It's just a, um, it's, it's basically just a hash map um, but it is, it is serialized with a Python pickle. Um, we are planning on changing that to a, a more common interface uh, for, for SALT 2.0. So in, in the future, yes, it'll be really easy to be able to just say, hey, let's just build a minion using Perl. And, and that Perl minion will be able to attach. And then part of the motivation there to change that, uh, uh, to change what uh, the serialization is, is to be able to, say, build salt minions that are running on embedded devices. Um, I, was, I was really surprised because as soon as we got this out there, I mean, I thought, well, we're going to use this to admin servers, but we've got people now using it in high-performance computing. We've got people using it to communicate with lots of embedded devices. There's some demand. <laughs> There's some demand to get it running on, on Android. So so that you can have, say, this distributed cloud of Android systems. And so that's one of our major motivations to, to change the serialization medium um, in the relatively near future uh, so, that, so that we can address all of these um, platform requests that are coming up and these interlanguage requests and so that we can build minions to specific purposes. Right. Now, you mentioned in there uh, Android, um, and one of the things that I'm beginning to notice, I, I'm sitting here at the desk with a, uh, an Android tablet with a keyboard, and I'm beginning to notice that I'm using this when I'm traveling for uh, all of my interaction with my systems back in the server room. Uh, so I have uh, SSH on it, and, and I, I run VNC on it. Um, is it feasible to have status monitors for SALT created for Android or for other uh, closed proprietary operating systems that I shan't name? Uh, yeah, it definitely is. And, and we're actively working on um, building out the support. Right now, the, the, the Minion and Module support only cover a bunch of Linux distributions and FreeBSD. Uh, but, but we've got a couple of community members that are working on Windows support. We've got some community members that are working on um, Mac support and, and, and a number of other uh, uh, platforms, and Android is definitely on that list. Right. And, of course, you've picked the Apache license there, so you're not going to have any of the, the problems getting into any of the, uh, the proprietary um, package distribution systems. Exactly. It makes it a lot easier for us to interact with a lot of the different systems that are available out there. Right, right. And so, uh, is this? Can I can I expect in the future to have some sort of a you know on-off button for my server that I can run on uh, my phone as easily as I can unlock my uh, zip car? Yeah, we're we're actually working right now. We've just started work on uh, an interface called Salt Web that is primarily going to be um, a web front end for for the Salt for the Salt Master, but it's also going to be. Uh, uh, give us give us a REST API so that we'll be able to have a um, an API that you can attach to from say a cell phone and then do all of your server can, server management back into the master from 
from a phone or, or any other device and gather all of that data. And then at the same token, do it in such a way that's very secure so that if you lose your phone, you don't just get hacked. Right, right. So uh, one other thing that's been sitting here on my, in front of my mind all the way through the discussion is that name Salt. Where did that come from? What does it mean? <laughs> um, it, was, it was kind of an arbitrary name. The, um, I mean, I, I, I kicked around through a lot of your normal naming conventions, which is given a name describing what it does. Um, but I, I, I ended up thinking that I wanted something that was a little more original and witty. And the whole idea with SALT is to try and convey the fact that the application is something that allows this uh, or facilitates this ubiquitous access to systems. And if anything is ubiquitous in, in this world, it's salt. I mean, we, need, we need salt everywhere. And, um, and yeah, so the real thing that I'm trying to convey is, is the ubiquity of the application and that, uh, and that it has this sort of uh, softly running in the background everywhere kind of, uh, kind of capability. So, looking at the uh, at your description now, the implementation. Um, so, I'm seeing that you're using zero MQ, and I know that zero MQ has the ability to have um, uh, like adapters that basically can take the sub pub stuff and put it like through firewalls or like that. Are you uh, is salt friendly to all that? Does, can I can I put like a, a, a very advanced uh, um, zero MQ configuration and work well with salt? Um. We've, we've only done a, a certain amount of uh, um, network traffic configuration inside so far, uh, but but yeah, there there is and there is more of that to come. As far as as far as building up, so for instance, if you wanted to build a special purpose minion, uh, then definitely uh, it's it's very feasible as long as as long as you've still got a a zero MQ socket type of subscribe hooking back mm -hmm. in the master, and you're able to uh, use that. Re the reply, the request reply um, interface, then you're good to go. Uh, we we have yes been able to get Salt to work over very interesting and disparate connections, where you've got say a Salt master controlling um, another Salt master that's controlling a set of minions, um, and then between every one of the interconnects is is the internet or some extremely difficult to maintain connection via a satellite out somewhere. Um, and we and it's been able to been able to maintain connection, um, but yeah, you you would be able to use a lot of uh, uh, this type of interactivity if you were, were building a custom minion. So let's look at more at the configuration management side because I, I think that's interesting. I, I, obviously, the, the ability to run a command on a bunch of hosts at once, I, I immediately see the application for that because, like I said, I built the same tool 20 years ago. Um, yeah, most but, of us have. <laughs> sorry, what? Most of us have built that. Yeah. Tool, sorry. Yeah, it's really interesting that it's it's a it's a problem that a lot of sysadmins you know scratch that itch over and over and over again. I mean, like I, like I said, I, I didn't write the tool based on just my own thinking about it. I saw someone else write the tool in some other language. I think it was Shell, and and I thought, well, no, I could do that in Perl in like seventy lines or so, and it worked, turned out to be quite that affection. Um, but uh, let's look at configuration management now. Um, I, I, I'm I'm somewhat familiar with Puppet. I, I'm being forced to learn Puppet actually as part of the problem. Um, and and what it has is a, is a few different pieces to it. It has the ability to uh, have a hierarchical set of uh, recipes about things. So you know generally servers are like this, except the particular class of web servers has this additional feature, and maybe this machine has additional features as well. And it also has the ability to have templated files, which can take values and plug them in and create the real files from there. Is, is, is Salt up to that yet, or are we still looking to this in the future? Uh, right now, I think that Salt is a very viable replacement for Puppet, and it can do a lot of this stuff. And uh, I would argue that it can be that it's much more dynamic in how in how you define uh, the states and how Puppet works. Because what Salt does is that uh, under the hood. The state that you define, um, or in Puppet vernacular, would be a manifest. But the state that you define is defined in a um, in a data structure, mm -hmm. and so uh, and so it makes it very flexible how you define uh, your state. Uh, but it also uh, is running or compiling that data structure on the client end. 
And so the, the benefit that we see here is that we get a lot more flexibility. So by default, a state is written in YAML. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, very straightforward and then wrapped in a Python Jinja template. And that Jinja template has access to two of the um, components inside of SALT called grains and the, and the SALT modules themselves. And so the benefit that we get there is that when you're actually building this, um, this state, you can run commands on the minion itself to find out what's going on. You've got access to grains, which would be very similar to what Factor is. We don't have something like, exactly like Factor because we don't, we don't need it um, because, the, because the setup is a little different. Um, but so the benefit here is that we can build a hierarchy, we can extend other modules, um, we can, or other, uh, other assault states, sorry. Um, we, can ex uh, we can include them, we can, uh, we can polymorph them, but instead of doing it in a, uh, in a very specific class hierarchy, it's, it's a very straightforward extension methodology that, that so far with the people I've worked with, they've been able to understand it very, very quickly. Uh, generally speaking, I've had people writing salt modules or, and salt states and extending them and um, uh, getting all their hierarchies in place. Uh, after only talking to them for between 10 and 30 minutes about how it works. Uh, so, and yeah, that was one of the goals, to make it very, very intuitive. So I can do things in the descriptions of what I want to install on the machines, just be like um, someone a puppet does where I can say, I want to make sure this package is installed first. I want to make sure then that I have this configuration file that is templated uh, using something I'm not familiar with. You mentioned a Python templating system of some kind? Yeah, the, the, the default Python templating system is uh, Jinja, uh, which is the which is a very very popular um, uh -huh. Python templating system. Uh, but you could also at this point uh, also template those files using a different templating language. Right now we only support Jinja and Mako, uh, but we plan on putting support for more and more and more templating engines in the future. So really, you could use any any templating system that you that you'd like. Cool. So uh, I could spell this out in terms of, you know, first this package needs to be installed. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking actually today's task is to get uh, uh, here at work is to get uh, Gitolite uh, puppeted so I can install Gitolite on a machine. And it requires first installing the packages that come from the uh, archives, uh, from the repos, and then uh, creating a Git user and then creating or up updating a, a templated file. Uh, with the appropriate information for the local machine. And because we also want to do this in dev environment, we have to also make sure that it has the right dev uh, um, IP address and so on. Is, so that's something that I could, out of the box, do with um, Salt then, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and Salt, Salt also supports environments so that, you can, so that you can have code specific to certain environments. And then you have that environment information when it's actually rendering that code. So it's very easy inside of your Salt state to say, well, you know, if we're environment Y, then the IP is this, or, um, or so on. And the other nice thing is that since Salt's rendering on the, um, on the client side for this, we can we can put full language constructs in, if we need to, to to define things. So, for instance, uh, back back as an implementation reference, um, we were setting up at one company MooseFS, which is a really slick distributed file system, um, but They'd been doing it with Puppet, and to set it up with Puppet, they had to, they had to download a shell script, mm -hmm. execute the shell script, send information to a file, and then have um, uh, and then have another script go through and set up all their mounts. And so it was something like a four-step process that involved um, over six or seven different manifests. Whereas we came in and they said, okay, and they just started doing the same thing with Salt. And I said, no, no, no. We can do everything you've done in a for loop. Hmm. And so we, we took all of their manifests and we did the exact same thing in, in one salt state uh, just because we had a for loop and because we could just run an arbitrary command on the minion inside of the state to gather the information that we needed. Uh, so, yeah, it, it sped the process up dramatically. Um, at, uh, yeah, at, uh, I've, I've had a couple of situations where we've rewritten an entire puppet tree um, that, that has taken uh, the company months and months and months and months of work to do in, in the time of sometimes as little as uh, 40 to 80 man hours. 
Right. Because, no. because salt's representation is just incredibly simplistic. This all sounds it's really complicated. Um, how, how easy is it to actually to get started with? You know, where would I start if I wanted to start uh, exploring using salt? Is it going to take me weeks of understanding esoteric scripts and libraries, or am I going to be able to just drop something in and get started and build from a simple base? One of the really nice things about salt is that um, it's very straightforward to get going. Uh, the install is, is a snap. We've got packages for more distributions. We're getting more packages as time goes on. So all you really need to do is uh, turn it on. Uh, we'll install the package. Turn salt on. Uh, make sure the minion knows where the master is. That's all the configuration you need um, to get the remote execution going. Then to get states going, um, actually setting them up is, is a walk in the park. We've got a tutorial on saltstack.org. Um, it walks you through uh, setting up setting up what we call the salt state tree. Uh, the state tree is very straightforward. You've got what's called a top file, and it just says, hey, these minions do this stuff, and we match the minions the same way that we do with the, with the salt command line. So you can do it based on regular expressions or globs or, or system properties. Um, and then that just links right over to, to the states that are running. Um, and those states that you build are, again, very, very straightforward. It's just a, just a little quib of YAML. And, um, and right out the gate, you can, or, or we've been able to get people running on salt and get people learning how it's going in, in just a matter of minutes. Um, and most people have been able to come back and say things like, well, I, I set up Puppet and I set up M Collective and I set up Funk or, you know, any, all these different... Um, tools and, and it took me so long and then they say then I found salt and I was up and running in 10 minutes right, right. so I can just get, go, go into uh, Ubuntu and uh, check the checkbox in this, on the screen and I'm up and running within a few minutes pretty much right right it's cool so is this your first open source project or have you been involved in open source projects before um, I've only done a couple before now I've, I've contributed to a few other open source projects um, uh, I'm I'm a committer to Arch Linux. Um, I, I wrote a I wrote another project, uh, pretty small project called Varch, which is a, a virtual machine image builder for Arch Linux. And um, uh, let's see, I built libguestfs support for Arch, um, although it's been updated by uh, by by a friend of mine, Eric Nolte, recently. Um, so I mean, I've I've dabbled a little bit. In contributions in the past, right, right. And why, why did you think it was important for Salt to be open source? I mean, why not just use it for your work and and keep it yourself? Well, I, I think I think that there was a really big, I think that there is a really big need for this. I, I shouldn't say I think. I'm very convinced there is, because because I've never been somewhere that didn't need remote execution and that didn't have their own homegrown setup for it. And um, and I felt that that it would be a better product or or project I should say I shouldn't I shouldn't say product I'm trying to make it a project <laughs> um, if if it was in the hands of the community and and if it was out there and I mean I'm a firm believer in open source and uh, and and what it is and uh, and then the massive benefits that that making a project open source affords. Not only the project, but communities and and companies, and and you know when I stack everything up, it's also very clear in my mind that open sourcing a project is is more beneficial to the developer in almost all cases, because not only does the develop, developer have the benefit of having a community out there that's willing to assist and work with them, um, but they also get to learn so much and they get and they get their name out there more and things of this nature where we're building a proprietary product um, especially from the perspective of just a bloke in a basement um, building that proprietary product it, it's a much steeper climb to get it to market whereas I mean I was able to push salt out and people are using it around the world I mean, we've got guys in England using it Germany um, Australia Canada all over the US and just because I toss it up on GitHub and and uh, mentioned it to a few folks, and it's it's getting out there, which is right. much more beneficial than me just saying, 
well, my company's got this tool that's going to die if I ever get a new job. Right, right. It's certainly a man after my own heart in uh, you know, seeing open source is not about uh, getting free stuff. It's about synchronizing the interest in a community to make bigger things happen. Uh, has that paid off for you? Has it meant that you've got uh, wider open platform support than you would have had otherwise? Oh, yeah. The, um, uh, right, right out the gate, uh, well, that, just most of the ideas on how to, on how to implement things have been have been greatly influenced by from feedback from the community. I mean, not it's not just the contributions; it's it's the it's the community mindset and the ability for, to hear what people are saying and then be able to say, "Hey, I've got this feature. I'm thinking about implementing this this way. You know, what do you guys think?" And they're able to come back and 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 give positive feedback and help direct the project. And then when it's open like this, you get a really good view. Of what the real demand is. I mean, we all know that when we develop something in house for a single company, then it begins to gear towards that company. Instead of being built in such a manner that is generic and feasible for anybody to use. And those types of things have been such a massive benefit to the development of SALT. And um, it's really the, the aspect of open source is not only the vehicle of communication getting it out, but it's also the vehicle of um, developing it in such a way that it's more conducive to, to what uh, everyone's needs are. It's really interesting too because it means that people that have a, a particularly unique uh, scratch to itch no, itch to scratch. I got that backwards. <laughs> itch to scratch. Uh, you don't have scratches to itch. That doesn't make any sense. Um, that they can, can they can modify this application. They can take it in their direction and uh, also are somewhat encouraged then to contribute that back as in the form of a module that you can plug in for other people. Do you have like a like a, a, a like a repository for modules, or do they just all end up as part of the um, as part of the distro? Uh, so far, all of them have just ended up as part of the distribution. Um, uh, we, we are getting to the point now, though, because like I, like I said earlier, I think we're at 38 execution modules. Um, and, and it's worth mentioning that, that I've talked about these modules over and over again, but, but every interactive aspect of SALT is modular. Um, so we, we are one, to answer your question, yes, going to set up a... Uh, a community module repository for people to dump modules in. Um, but also since things are module, all of our different interactions are very easy to add. So where we've said it's really easy to add one of these execution modules for the state system, those are all just modules too. And so it's really easy for someone to say, well, I want a module in my state system or a state module that is uh, that allows me to enforce something very specific. Say, say, my specific Django application or my specific Ruby on Rails application or, or log rotate or who knows what. Mm -hmm. And they can just toss a module into the state system to extend it. And it's written in such a way also that's very, very straightforward and easy to do. And then on the flip side, say that we're writing our, um, they're writing their states. And they say, well, we love that it's written in YAML for, for the data structure representation, but we're a cheetah shop or some random templating engine that I haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. And they can very easily add a module that would allow them to write all of their states in cheetah or random templating engine. Cool. And, and uh, I'm presuming that given this is in, written in Python and uh, you really can port this, at least in terms of its execution, to anything that involves Python and 0MQ libraries, uh, is there a more restriction than that? And also, do the modules also have portability issues? Um, yeah, right now everything is still is still Python. The modules themselves, actually, they've got a slick little feature that um, that when the module is initially loaded by the minion, it can detect and see if it's applicable to that platform or not. So that so that the module can be set up for specific targets. Which which will which greatly uh, Im improves the sorry the portability, and so mm -hmm. uh, what what happens is that we've got um, let me back up a touch. There we go. 
<laughs> we've got uh, the PKG execution module and the state module. Well, the state module is generic, and it just plugs into the PKG execution module, which means that when you write a uh, package support for distribution, all you have to do is, is say that when this thing gets loaded with what we call the virtual function inside the module, um, when this thing when this this thing gets loaded, if it's uh, running on platform Y, then load it. Otherwise, just throw it away because it's not applicable. Uh, which means that we can make it very dynamically pluggable into pretty much anything. And the functionality to to make that happen is actually extremely straightforward. So if I have Python and I have access to a zero MQ library. Uh, I can install this from a tarball, and whatever sort of modules apply to my particular architecture, like FreeBSD or CentOS or whatever, they're going to just install themselves, uh, and if something gets asked that's not applicable, it's just going to be ignored. Exactly. Okay, and uh, how about, but, but uh, some of these things are generic things like I you know package installation uh, is completely different on CentOS versus FreeBSD so uh, does the installation module need to know that and how does it distinguish that and how portable are things like package installation then so this is actually pretty slick because what what happens is again when when that module is loaded so for instance we have a module called yum um, and that module it's got in it the uh, function called virtual so when so when um, the minion loads up that yum module it runs the virtual function to say hey am i a red hat like system am i red hat or scientific or fedora or something like this and if i am then this yum module we're not we're never going to call it yum it's going to be called package mm -hmm. and so what happens is say i've got and that's, that's how it works, that if we've got a Red Hat system and a Debian system and a um, Arch Linux system and an Ubuntu system and so on and so on and so on, that, that from the master or from the state system, we can just say package install mm -hmm. and it'll automatically just go back and map to the right package manager for you. We also have the problem, though, in that, and, and this was just being described to me when we were talking about installing this um, Gitalite package for Puppet, or when we're puppeting it, is that on Debian, the Perl modules are named one thing, but on CentOS, they're named something else. So is there also some virtualization in what you call the module as you're passing it to this installer script? Um, yeah, generally, when, when you're setting up a, so when you're setting up a state, mm -hmm. Uh, what what you what you would do is just give it an if the OS is Red Hat then the name is um, sorry I forgot the the two Gitolite package names well it was Perl <laughs> something actually it wasn't Gitolite Gitolite's the problem oh, sorry, but uh, it's a Perl package yeah but but yeah you just you just say you know if it's this then name is um, then yeah name is whatever it is for that platform LF uh -huh. this name is for whatever that platform is. Okay, okay, so I could probably make that work then. Uh, great. Uh, just a couple more questions because okay. we're running out of time here. Um, how about high availability? Is, uh, can I run these in parallel, like two different servers, so that the clients can call in and use whatever one happens to be up? Or, uh, or have you thought about that yet? So the, the master is a, a fairly, a, a lot of it tries to be generic and simplistic. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to set up like three or four masters and to have one of them live with a VIP and use mm -hmm. them like keep alive uh -huh. um, across, across the multiple masters. And if one fails, then another one can come online. It's also important that, the, um, that there are provisions in place that can automatically replicate, um, uh, that can automatically replicate settings and all of the state files from one master to another. And then on top of that, there's something, and we're getting a little, a little deeper here, mm -hmm. um, but there's something called a syndic interface, which is named after a uh, medieval bureaucrat, because I don't <laughs> want a bureaucrat, because no one likes that. Um, <laughs> that's effectively what it is. Yeah. It allows a higher level master to control a lower level master, who's therefore then controlling more minions. 
And so you can have not only high availability across your masters in this respect, but then have another layer with high availability that allows you to control multiple masters distributed across multiple locations um, in a very seamless ma manner so that you've got not only high availability inside of an individual execution scope, um, but you've also got high availability and scalability across multiple data centers or clouds or however you would want to want to scale it out. Wow. Are you also using the, um, uh, the subscribe capability of PubSub to only filter the messages you need, or is it just everybody, everything going to every client and then it sorts it out from there? Um, we, we don't have, that's part of the 2.0 change the serialization. We've got a, <laughs> we've got a couple things in the change the serialization um, goal right now. And one of them is to use zero MQ's methodology for filtering. The, the reason we didn't do it, I, I didn't do it initially, was because um, there's, there's just too much uh, functionality inside of the filtering. Because it goes out to all of these, um, it goes out to all of these clients, and there's so many different things uh, that it can filter based on, and it's generally based on information it's going to have to grab uh -huh. from that individual minion. Yeah, I can see that. I, and actually, you know, the the the, the pub sub uh, filtering is, is somewhat simplistic. It's just looking for a prefix string, well, one of many exactly. perhaps, but prefix string. And I think you have more of a am I red hat and do I have this state, uh, which is going to be a really complex thing to, to uh, subscribe to. So exactly. I can see that be a problem. Uh, okay, a couple more quick questions. Um, uh, load on the master machine is. Uh, have you seen scaling problems there, or do you just then use a syndic to take care of that? And authentication, how do, you, how do you know it's really one of your clients phoning home? So um, I've built in an RSA key, uh, key authentication system, and then it uses AES um, encryption for all the messages. So all of the messages and all the line transfers are encrypted. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just use RSA keys for authentication. So a minion starts up and it says, hey, hey, master, here's my... Here's my public key in the clear, it's a public key, yeah. and the master says, okay, have I accepted your public key yet? If so, then um, I'll encrypt the AES key with the public key and shoot it on back mm -hmm. so that we've got, so that we've got that, and there's, there's a lot more to it than that, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a full encryption system, an authentication system, but since it's with uh, RSA keys, that allows us to. That's allowed. That's allowed me to build the system such that uh, all of the encryption is embedded and very purpose built for a zero MQ like topology. And the benefit of having the zero MQ like encryption topology is that it's a, it's ridiculously fast, and it's really easy and straightforward to use. I don't know if I mean there there are a number of other. Uh, system similar to, to this that use SSL certs and um, I've seen them become extremely complicated and, um, and throw really weird uh, errors in the past whereas um, the benefit of using a very simple SSH style encryption set is that it's always been very very simple if we have a mismatch of keys to be able to just delete the bad key and accept a good key and um, and another thing that, that I've built in is that I've worked in the rare situation where I really didn't want encryption on my internal network, um, primarily um, government systems. And um, and so SALT does have the the dangerous mode of turning off authentication if you really want to be a reckless fool. Wow, you know, and in fact, I was just going to ask that as I was hearing your description of the exchange of the public key and then handing the private key back. I went, oh, that's SSL. He's reinvented SSL. Does he know that? And apparently you do because you've compared it to your SSL just moments later. So uh, thank you for your analysis. So I didn't have to actually ask the question. Um, we've asked a lot of questions about SALT. I'm actually very excited about this project now. I want to actually go back upstairs and to my uh, boss and recommend this for some of our new deployment. Um, but is there anything we've left out in this conversation that you really want to make sure our audience is aware of? Um, golly, you know, I don't know. I mean, we've got, uh, 
we've we've covered a lot of bases. There's 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 a lot of documentation on saltstack.org. Mm -hmm. We've got a great tutorial on how to get going with salt states. It is noteworthy that we're still fairly young. If you run into a bug, please report it. We will get it fixed as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, but we are very interested in, in being involved and in helping more people deploy salt and get get salt states going. And um, yeah, there's, and I there's a lot. Sorry. I presume you have the normal support things like a mailing list and, a, and maybe an IRC channel and stuff? Yep, that community link that we've had on the bottom of the screen for, for most of this, and there it is again, um, <laughs> has, has links to our IRC channel. We've okay. got a mailing list, um, and, uh, and we're up on GitHub, so you can follow Salt on GitHub or Fork Salt on GitHub, uh -huh. and all those wonderful benefits that you get from, uh, from using GitHub. Very good, very good. Well, it, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I've, uh, like I said, it's one of these times when uh, I'm listening to somebody describe a project and go, I really see a use for that. I mean, despite the fact that it's in Python, so I'm not going to ask you what's your favorite uh, scripting language. I already know the answer to that. Uh, but <laughs> in spite of the fact it's in Python, I think I could actually uh, make use of this. So uh, I appreciate you putting the effort into making this there and, and also uh, contacting us to get on the show because that's, uh, that's been helpful. Um, and, uh, and just want to thank you for being on the show. Welcome and thank you. Well, I'm, I'm grateful that you that you're willing to have me on. Thanks. Very good. Very good. So thank you. That was uh, Thomas Hatch speaking to us from Salt Lake City, the first word of which being salt and his project. Uh, very fascinating. Like I just, just told him, uh, Simon, what do you think? It's very interesting. You know, I, uh, I was just reflecting on the fact that back in 1987, um, I wrote a uh, remote execution system for the CTOS operating system using Pascal. And it seems that to, you give a geek a network and the first thing he writes is remote execution. So it's good to see something which is an evolved second or third generation, or it sounded like it was his fourth generation piece of work there, something that's evolved, that's um, easy to deploy and use. That sounds like a thoroughly good thing and I, I'm going to be checking it out just for my home network, let alone for anything at work. Well, yeah, and, and like I said, you know, it's going to be real easy to uh, sell this to uh, the, the local community, except you know, all the investment we've made in Puppet uh, here at the main client I've got right now. Uh, but um, but you know it is it is sort of a real common thing though it's like okay I I, I have twenty boxes and I want to like just calc just, just go see what the uptime was I'm gonna say okay give me all your uptimes you know so I can I can do that and that, that's why I wrote this script twenty years ago was to do the the same sort of thing now this whole aspect though of also being able to to maintain state and to sort of marry this idea of a global shell together with uh, a puppet like configuration management. That's smart. I think this is. I, I think this has a chance of really going somewhere because I, it, it's an interesting space to solve, interesting problem space to solve, and it, and it's interesting to mix both of those. And you know, I've been studying ZeroMQ for a while. We, we're going to have uh, the ZeroMQ guy uh, on, on in a few weeks, um, and so I've been studying in advance for that. And and to have this be done with that, which scales well, uh, has uh, a lot of robustness to it. <clears throat> And uh, easy payloads and easy clients. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking Salt's going to go somewhere. So um, glad to have him on the show. Very, very nice. Any, anything else, Simon? No, I, I, the only thing that I've been uh, meditating on here now is how uh, the next wave of this is to move into the cloud to mm -hmm. understand how you're going to administer cloud systems. And that's going to be the point at which it's going to start getting uh, more chewy. You're going to need to start to have uh, stronger authentication involved. You're going mm -hmm. to need to start to have um, more audit, uh, more uh, observability by your uh, 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 business control folks. So, mm -hmm. th you know, this looks to me like it's evolved as far as sysadmin is going to take it. And the next stage from here is, uh, is a, a lot more formal and business related. So I, I think it's very well evolved. V looking forward to giving it a try myself at home. And absolutely, and I encourage anybody who listened to the show and is now ins as inspired as I am just now, uh, go check it out. Definitely, uh, saltstack.org and, uh, and, and places beyond that as well. So uh, just looking at the upcoming guest list, which I tend to do at this point in the show, uh, we've got the show next week with Jim Kwok. Uh, uh Simon, you want to describe that? 
So uh, Jim Killick is the Killick. executive director of uh, the Open Rights Group. Mm -hmm. Open Rights Group is, if you will, the UK's equivalent of the Elect Elec Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, it's promoting digital liberty in the United Kingdom. So uh, taking on issues like uh, firewalling, um, uh, content blocking, uh, copyright, the, the abuse of copyright control to take away creativity. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, other issues like that. Uh, and Jim Killick is their executive director, he's a staff member, and I'll be visiting him in his office in London and mm -hmm. covering for uh, all you Americans who are going to be uh, eating turkey that day. Ah, oh, yes, yes. In fact, it's next week. It's the British Invasion Show. Uh, um, uh, Dan Lynch is also co-hosting with you on that day. So uh, it'll be a totally British show next week. The week after that, we've got uh, James Talberg who talked to us about Pinax, Pinax, which is a uh, Django-based, um, Python again, Django-based uh, um, uh, web framework that apparently does some, has some really cool stuff going on for it. The big show coming up after that, Monty Wadenius. Wadenius. Monty Wadenius. Thank you. There we go. Monty is going to be uh, coming on the show with uh, Kurt von Fink, who's one of his cohorts, talking to us about MySQL, MariaDB, and maybe uh, maybe uh, throw a couple of grenades in Sun's direction in the process of that. Uh, David Mirza, uh, Vegas security tester, following us on that. Uh, uh, ooh. Kleber Rosa, I should actually look at my list, I forgot how to pronounce these names, uh, about Autotest, which is being used to test the Linux kernel, also going to be uh, with joining us uh, shortly after that. And as I mentioned briefly on this show, uh, Peter Hinchens, uh, who's the lead architect for Zero MQ, is rounding out the year for us and going to talk to us about all that. Uh, I'm gone next week. I'm going to be um, uh, celebrating my birthday and Thanksgiving all in the same week. That often happens. Uh, tend to be roughly in the same week, but occasionally it's on Thanksgiving, my birthday. In fact, my 18th birthday was on Thanksgiving, I that was appropriate entering manhood on the day of Turkey Day. Uh, so uh, you can uh, you, you won't be seeing me next week. Uh, you'll be seeing again Simon and Dan for that. Uh, you can follow us to find out when we have new guests. Uh, I, I tend to even post in absentia. I still actually tweet on this. Uh, Floss Weekly, all one word, on both Identica and uh, Twitter. And I usually announce the guests as I book them. And also I try to give a, a promotion of whatever the upcoming guest is for that week. You can also watch us on a live chat. We, uh, we actually take questions from the chat room. Didn't take much this week, but uh, live.twit.tv while we're taping. That's 9.30 Pacific on Wednesdays. Uh, follow, be sure you follow the Pacific time of the U.S. because our daylight savings times apparently is unlike anywhere else in the world. So we have a really unusual daylight savings time change here. Um, you can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter and Identica. Uh, and uh, if you follow me, you'd also know I'm heading to the Jonathan Colton uh, concert tonight uh, down at the House of Blues. And they might be giants. I've never seen either of them like in a formal concert. So it's really kind of interesting to go see them, although I did see them a bit on Joko Cruz Crazy 1. Uh, so uh, follow me, and you can find out where I'm eating, where I'm drinking, where I'm tweeting, what I'm doing each day. Follow me to find out about that. You can also see me on Google+. Plus. I tend to post a lot of things there as well. Uh, that's enough plugs for me. Simon, what do you want to plug today? Well, I thought that I would uh, use my plug space today to talk about a, 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 an issue that has come up in the chat room a number of times. I'd like to encourage all of your readers in the United States to go take a look at a, some very bad legislation that's going through U.S. Congress at the moment called SOPA. And uh, this legislation is going to um, put at risk the freedom of the Internet. It's going to try and put under control uh, the DNS system under U.S. control worldwide. Uh, it's a source of huge concern, and I encourage you to uh, simply go check anywhere you find SOPA mentioned in Geek Space and uh, take a look. You'll find we all hate it, and it needs you to get in touch with your congressman right now to tell them that this is a, f a fatally bad idea, worse even than the DMCA, which some people think is good by comparison, which you could, is an immediate indication that it must be lousy legislation. Go talk to your congressman and get it dealt with right now. Uh, and when you've done that, then you can visit webmink.com and find out about all of my stuff and follow me on Twitter as webmink and follow me on blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is my last travel of the year. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to come into the brick house and come and see all of the amazing toys Leo has got into this huge room here. Uh, mm. So you won't be able to see me uh, performing live anywhere after this, apart from, unless you're on the plane home from San Francisco on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, but I do have engagements coming up in the new year, and I'm looking to fill my calendar now. If you uh, would like me to speak at your conference or event, please get in touch with me now. Visit webmink.com, and uh, you'll find all the instructions there. Uh, so good. that's all the plugging I was going to do today, Randall. 
That's uh, that's plenty. That's good. That's uh, and I appreciate you bringing up the SOPA issue because I know that's very important to uh, us these days. Um, also, uh, just again, want to thank you for uh, making the trek all the way to Petaluma, uh, not just for the show, but I'm sure you had other things in the Bay Area to do. And I didn't realize you actually perform when you're on an airplane. Uh, I I don't do that. So is that something you just started doing? I, you know, I I do the the full snoring act while I'm up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I try and keep it in tune, make sure that it's good snoring that's happening. But uh, yeah, if you you if you're anywhere on the plane, you'll know that I'm on there because you will be able to hear me performing. Oh, very good, very good. And thank you again for uh, co-hosting this show. And uh, and we'll get to see you one more time next week. But then we're going to give you a break. We're going to send you home for a bit. So uh, glad we're going to be able to. Oh, wait, no, sorry, no. No, I'm. Two more. I, I think I'm. I'll be talking to Monty with you as well. Right. Okay. Then the week after that. So uh, hopefully y- y'all at home are enjoying Simon as much as I'm have, having him on the show. And uh, you're going to hear a lot more of him for the next couple of weeks. And uh, really appreciate you doing the work, Simon. So thanks for being on the show. Again. Great pleasure. And I can hear the music coming up. So I know that's the time that we're going to have to say we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.